Well, I think we can, we can start. So I want to welcome you all to this um, SIB Virtual Computational Biology Seminar Series. Um, today we have the pleasure to host Gunnar uh, Hetch, which is, uh, who is Professor of uh, Biomedical Informatics at the Computer Science Department of the ETH uh, Zurich. Uh, so Gunnar earned his, uh, his PhD at the German National Laboratory for Information Technology, where he also did a postdoc. Then from 2005 to 2011, he led a group uh, on machine learning in genome biology at the Friedrich Michel Laboratory in Tübingen. And then in 2012, he joined uh, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center as an associate faculty. And then in May 2016, he and his group moved to Zurich to join the computer science department of the ETH Zurich, where he still is. So his group's research lies at the interface between methods research in machine learning and sequence analysis and relevant application area in biology and medicine. Current research focuses include large-scale machine learning, accurate transcriptome reconstruction, identification of RNA processing regulators, developing, developing clinical decision support systems, and developing methods and resources for international data sharing of genomic and clinical data. The REACH laboratory has extensive expertise in analyzing the RNA-seq exome and oral genome data and has contributed to major discoveries in RNA processing regulation, RNA alteration, and their relevance in cancer. Um, so today, Gunnar will uh, tell us more about uh, these novel approaches to identify, understand, and take advantage of RNA alteration in human cancers. So thank you again, Gunnar, for accepting our invitation. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the uh, very nice introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and speaking here, talking about um, our recent work. Uh, some of that work has started while I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Um, and, and we are about to finish some of this. And I'm happy to talk about this here. OK, so let me start with some more general motivations before I go to specific topics. Um, so I think it's clear that some pieces of, of medicine uh, are relatively imprecise. Um, there's uh, medications uh, which are on the market, which make a lot of money, which are not uh, helpful for some of the patients which take those. What you see here is a figure from 2015. Um, uh, for instance, the first uh, drug um, which uh, has the la largest market share uh, and income uh, only benefits one-fifth of the patients who actually take this uh, drug. Uh, for the next drug, it's one out of 20 people who, um, who benefit from this, and 19 people don't uh, benefit from this. So there's a great imprecision to some parts of medicine, uh, and I think um, we have the understanding today that um, that phenotype, namely whether the drug works or not, um, is influenced uh, by uh, a genomic part, but also uh, by lifestyle, the environment, and, and so on. So it's uh, it's a complex system which we which we are, and it's influenced by many different uh, factors. So the genomic part, um, uh, there's a promise uh, that the genomics actually helps to um, understand uh, when certain drugs work, or when certain treatments work, and so on. And there are some successes, uh, some initial successes of genome-based uh, medicine. Uh, one is in pharmacogenomics, where you see certain mutations in the genome, uh, which lead uh, to um, a different binding pocket. And um, if you have that mutation, then this uh, may change the um, efficacy of, of a specific uh, drug, um, for instance, uh, here with a, a um, clopidogrel. Uh, another um, uh, case is rare diseases. Um, here's an example of a, of a 20 month old uh, girl which, had a, which has a rare neurodegenerative disease um, and has a, st a strange gait, uh, limb, uh, impaired vision, and so on. And uh, only by exome sequencing it was found that this uh, girl had a efficiency in a vitamin B a transport a mechanism, and, um, and this revealed how to treat this patient uh, in this case uh, by giving more vitamin B. To, uh, and this, I think, almost completely um, uh, cured that uh, patient. And then in other cases, uh, we have uh, another example is cancer treatments, where we look at specific mutations, uh, which may be common uh, even among different, across different cancer types. And if you have a certain mutation, then you can treat uh, patients um, uh, for these specific mutations um, with specific drugs. So, I mean, there is, there is a great need for large-scale um, 
clinical genomics. So I think it's clear that uh, uh, rare diseases, most people who, who have rare diseases will uh, get uh, their se genome sequenced uh, relatively soon. Um, it will be become common practice to do so. Similar um, for patients who have a, a cancer, uh, their cancer genomes will likely be sequenced very soon. So the estimates um, are that uh, within five years, probably, uh, that 15% of the developed uh, world population will be sequenced um, either for rare diseases or for cancers or for some other reason. So just thinking about uh, the data sizes which are involved here, so this is uh, quite drastic. So um, maybe a cancer genome uh, is 300 gigabytes total in sequencing, and um, a germline genome maybe uh, 90 gigabytes in sequencing. So if you multiply this with 150 million people, that is uh, about 28 exabyte of data. So if you would all put it in one place, um, that would be roughly uh, the size of what Google stored maybe maybe a few years ago. So it's quite uh, quite large. So that needs uh, new algorithms and it new, needs new concepts uh, how to work with these um, uh, data sets and, and how to distribute them and so on. And we, we did some work, uh, which I can't uh, go into detail much here, um, on, on genome graphs where we can actually collapse a lot of the genome sequences which are very similar to uh, one data structure um, to, to more efficiently access and store uh, such such large data data sets of genomes. Okay, but um, the genomics part is just one part. Um, we have the other challenge that uh, we have the lifestyle, the environment, we have uh, clinical data, uh, which we also have to capture. And a few years ago, or maybe 20 years ago, the data looked like this. Um, uh, it was in non-digital form. Um, nowadays, the data is maybe in digital form or in mostly digital form, but it is in some databases, and these databases are hard to access and they are not designed for um, research purposes. They are designed for clinical purposes, right? So, and it's really hard uh, to actually uh, get the data out for research purposes. Um, uh, these, these databases are yeah, not, not fast enough and, and they don't deliver what we actually need and, and so on. So what we really would like to have is uh, data in a somewhat more intelligent form and a much, a much more accessible form in the future. Um, so, I mean, obviously this data is already used in clinical studies uh, and these clinical studies are needed uh, in order to show the efficacy of certain treatments. And usually what happens is uh, that you have this institutional database, um, you have a patient cohort, and then you have people. People who go into this database and read off uh, what's stored in the database, um, read uh, the medical documents and extract certain pieces of information which are needed for that clinical trial. Um, and then they enter this uh, information into the clinical research database. At a hospital like uh, MSKCC, there is, uh, there's lots of clinical trials going on and uh, there's 500 full-time employees who do this all the time. So that's why this little cubicle uh, farm here, right? So because it's really uh, many people who actually do this uh, who are involved in extracting information out of electronic health records. So this is, I mean, from a computer science perspective, that's totally inefficient and, and totally unacceptable uh, that uh, to go this way. And uh, I think we have to solve this uh, as computer scientists. So I think there's uh, quite a few challenges, data science challenges, uh, which we have to uh, solve at medical centers. Uh, just thinking about uh, efficient search and information retrieval, I mean, we, we know how to do this in principle. Google can do this, right? So, but it's not done on medical records. Uh, right now, it's very hard to visualize uh, something uh, like a patient uh, med electronic health record um, as we can do, for instance, visualize something uh, like a piece of genome. That, that, displays quite complex data, right? So, but uh, we cannot do this with patient data um, as well. And obviously we need high performance um, uh, data access and computing within the hospitals, uh, efficient data structure, scalable computing, all within hospitals. And we need some data science mindset, I think, also in hospitals. And this is a kind of a long way we still have to go, but I think that's where we have to go in eventually, right? So, I think the challenges which you have to solve um, as, as researchers and maybe also as people who are push research into hospitals is we have to um, develop, of course, new data science approaches for medical data. So maybe we need new methods for, for data, for medical data. But also we have to provide tools for the community so the hospital could actually use this and, and reproduce some of our analyses um, um, and our, uh, use our tools. Then obviously we have to solve biomedical problems, so uh, solve cancer or solve a specific part uh, in, in that quest. Um, 
and, and uh, we usually do this through collaboration. But I think a big challenge is also uh, to create an environment which allows us to do this. So where we can actually uh, do these, uh, solve these first three challenges. So an environment where the medical data is in one place, where the researchers are in one place, and um, everything can come together. And um, that's, I think, an important uh, step, an important goal. And uh, that's uh, one goal which is uh, attacked by the Swiss Personalized Health Network and by the Data Coordination Center. Um, is to create a um, network of uh, compute systems uh, which are interacting with each other, and these compute systems um, are, um, uh, provide means uh, to, to bring in hospital data, to bring in research data, and to perform the research on that data um, within a secure uh, IT environment. And there's, there's people in this room who are involved in this uh, uh, to provide this uh, kind of platform. And I think this is a very important um, effort and without which uh, it's going to be very hard to do uh, any meaningful research on medical data and genomic data. Okay, so this is ongoing. Um, uh, the SPHN um, network has started last year. The first project started this year, and, um, and we will see in the future how, how much uh, this will develop. So now let's uh, get closer to what uh, my lab is doing. Um, very brief over overview before I get into specific projects. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, we work on data structures for genomics. Uh, we try to um, develop um, genome graph data structures so we can actually encode and store information about uh, uh, thousands or millions uh, of, of genomes in an efficient way. Um, we also work uh, with uh, clinical data. Um, one project which we work on is um, on intensive care data. Um, the data here is from the Inselspital. Uh, we get uh, data from about 60,000 patients, and we would like to predict, um, uh, develop a early warning system for kidney failure or for heart failure. So you can actually uh, predict maybe a few hours in advance that something is going to be wrong with that patient, so uh, doctors are warned uh, early about this. So uh, we, we are interested in developing uh, methods for heterogeneous uh, bi biomedical data analysis, uh, for patient and disease modeling, and uh, we work on cancer uh, genomics. And most of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, about cancer genomics um, and anything related uh, to cancer, what we, what we work on. So uh, I will need to come back to talk about the other topics uh, at another opportunity. Okay, so project one. This is a project I started uh, when I was at MSKCC. At MSKCC, we had access to uh, some medical data and to, to some um, genomics data from, uh, these same, from the same patients. And here we uh, performed a joint analysis of clinical nodes uh, and somatic mutations. So a clinical node looked like this. Uh, it has different sections, uh, for instance, chief, complaint, history of present illness, and so on. And then there's a uh, summary of what the doctor wrote uh, at a certain point uh, about this patient. And uh, in this case, we had about two million um, uh, electronic, well, these kind of documents uh, from uh, a total of 200,000 uh, patients. Um, now, the question is, how do you extract information about this? Because it's quite heterogeneous. Every doctor writes something different. And uh, we had to come up with some ideas. Uh, and we came up with this relatively simple idea, which I'm happy to explain here. Um, so we thought um, a sentence is a good unit of information. So a sentence is a statement. It says something about the patient. Uh, it's relatively short. Uh, it's not too heterogeneous. Um, and um, and we thought we could just analyze sentences. So it, it has, has limitations, of course. But if you just count how many different sentences we have, we have about, have about 100 million sentences which we found in these 2 million uh, documents. So uh, what we did is we removed a kind of um, uh, stop words, which, which happen a lot. Uh, and then um, we uh, took these sentences and uh, thought Maybe sentences which share similar words probably mean the same thing. So we cluster these sentences. And uh, the idea is when, yeah, these clusters uh, probably um, have a lot of sentences which mean roughly the same thing. And this is kind of a description of a phenotype or of, of the medical um, condition of, of that patient. Okay? So, and, and here's uh, just a small piece of uh, that uh, graph um, which we generated. So each dot here is one sentence. Um, the color are different uh, clusters. This is just one little piece of, of a big uh, graph where the nearest neighbors of sentences are connected to each other. 
So uh, just to give you an idea uh, how, how similar or how different these are. Um, in the end, we, we uh, chose, I think, um, 10,000 cluster centers. Uh, we essentially reduced these 100 million sentences to uh, 10,000 clusters. And then we had for each patient uh, a description whether they had that sentence or they didn't have that sentence. So it's a binary vector, right? And that is something which we can uh, then analyze and we can connect to genomic data which you also had uh, for these patients. And um, in those cases, uh, in, in case of MSKCC, there were, is data from tumor sequencing. There's a thousand X um, um, sequencing of about 400 genes. Uh, so it's 342. I think it got a bit larger by now and about 100x of germline genome. So we got a list of somatic mutations for a subset of the genome. And the idea was, uh, can we connect uh, the um, data which we get from the text and associate that with uh, the genetic information, maybe conditioning on some clinical variables like uh, which cancer type and so on, um, uh, so we get more interesting um, uh, correlations. And here's just a, a one uh, basic result is still a somewhat preliminary. Um, uh, so here you have the gene, uh, here you have uh, the sentence prototype which describes that cluster sent, uh, this cluster um, sentence, uh, this cluster center. Um, and for instance, he underwent colonoscopy which revealed a, a polyp in the colon, right? So, and that is associated, uh, the presence of that sentence is associated with a somatic mutation in APC, which is not totally surprising, uh, but um, uh, we found some of these cases um, we could easily validate in the literature. They have been published about, um, and in some cases were much more recent or were not published about yet. So we see this as a, as a great source of hypotheses, which we can then go uh, and check with the doctors to discuss those and, and see uh, whether they mean something uh, meaningful. So something which helps maybe the treatment of the patients in the end. Okay, so this is ongoing work, um, but it's, uh, it's one way where we connect uh, clinical data with uh, more genomic data. I will take questions at the end. So the second uh, two projects uh, which, which I'm going to describe is mostly on genetic data, uh, where we don't have clinical data. Uh, these are from uh, large cancer genomics projects. This is from TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, this is a large uh, US um, uh, project from the National Cancer Institute. Uh, it has about 12,000 donors. It's about one petabyte of data. Um, it has uh, exome data, it has RNA-seq data, some whole genome data, and, and a few other modalities. And uh, the second project which I'm go going to describe is um, a subpart of ICGC. That's an international effort. Uh, it includes, I don't know, at least 20 countries, uh, 25,000 donors, and um, also about one petabyte of data in total. So there's probably hundreds of groups uh, generating uh, this data and also analyzing this data. And uh, you could say, well, why do we look at this? Probably every, everything has been done by now, right? So, um, and, uh, but we have certain um, uh, ideas how to analyze this data, and we're particularly interested in transcriptome changes. So my group has uh, been working on RNA uh, analyses and RNA splicing. And our view on this data was, uh, can we see anything in the transcriptome, which is maybe cancer specific, where anything, can, how can we exploit that? Um, and that hasn't been done so much. Uh, people have mostly looked at uh, somatic mutations themselves. Um, and, and these two projects, which I'm going to describe, um, uh, look at two different aspects of that. So the first one is really about alternative splicing. Um, here we look at cancer specific splicing and uh, the implications of in about 8,500 um, samples. And we wanted to find um, cancer-specific splicing patterns, uh, differences between cancer and normal. And we also were interested in identifying variants, um, so genomic variants, regulating splicing in cis or in trans. Um, so we learned something about gene regulation. And we also, as you can see, we, we thought about immunotherapy, whether this can be used for immunotherapy. So, and uh, we need two data types for this. We need uh, RNA-seq data to describe uh, splicing and the RNA, the gene expression and so on. And we need uh, exomes, we used exomes, which describe the variants um, near the ex exons. So typically not deep into the intron, but it uh, describes the variants next to the exons and maybe a little bit into the uh, intronic regions. And these are the interesting regions when you look into splicing. So it's, it's, a, it's a good data set to look at 
And it's a relatively large data set. So it's an association study with 8,500 samples. It's one of the biggest um, data sets you can look at, which is relatively homogeneous. Okay, so it's a um, relatively complex uh, project, I would say. Um, so we had uh, the PanCan Atlas data, which is, uh, I think, 30-ish um, cancer types. Each of the cancer types needs to be processed in some uniform way. Uh, we analyzed the RNA in a certain way, um, in a uniform way. We looked at the exome data. We uh, did the variant calling in a certain way. Um, and everything was processed in a uniform way. And then we uh, performed a different analyses. Um, so we performed a splicing QTL, which I'm going to describe, some differential splicing analysis. Then we identify neo-introns, uh, introns which are very cancer-specific, which you only can find in cancer. And then we show um, that uh, these introns generate peptides, uh, which can be validated by mass spec and um, uh, which may be used for immunotherapy in the end. So I, I will get to that. So it is a quite complicated uh, data flow, um, and it's quite massive in, in scale uh, to do this. Okay, so the main tool which we use is, a, is a, a tool for the analysis of alternative splicing. It's called Splatter, Splice Adder. Um, and the idea is that um, you look at an existing annotation, um, you look at the alignment of RNA-seq reads, so it takes any alignments, and it takes an existing annotation which may not be perfect. It uh, uses that annotation and annotates it, extends this annotation with additional uh, connections between exons, which we find in the aligned reads. Okay, so there's a read which starts on one exon and it goes into the next exon and then we see, oh yeah, that gives evidence for an intron which connects these two exons. And uh, it also detects new exons and new introns which have not been um, uh, annotated before. Um, so it finds novel and uh, can also quantify existing um, splicing events. So in the end, uh, we detect splicing events and we quantify splicing events. You can also do some differential analysis, which is optional. So we uh, stopped for this analysis here. We run this tool on all of uh, the 6, uh, 8,512 uh, samples and um, quantified splicing. So then you get essentially uh, a quantification for each splicing event. Is the exon included or not included? And this gives you a vector for each sample. And then you can visualize this, uh, this vector, uh, for instance, by T-SNE. Um, uh, and, and then you see, okay, um, actually there is, uh, each dot here is one sample. And then you can see uh, that there are major differences between the cancer types, which is not totally surprising. You, if you would do the same with um, gene expression, you would also find a similar uh, effect. So uh, for instance, here you find uh, the breast cancers. Um, uh, here you find uh, the ovarian cancers and, and so on. Um, but you can also look into more detail and uh, look into different subtypes of cancers. Uh, for instance, on the right of this panel D here, um, you see that uh, the subtypes of breast cancer, so the basal is here, um, the uh, luminal A and B, I think, are here, and, and this, I believe, is uh, the HER2 plus... Uh, no, this is not sure. So. Uh, luminal A is here, luminal B is in this one, and this one maybe here, right? And I think these are the normals, if I see it correctly. Um, so you can actually see a good spread of the subtypes. You could actually say for each um, uh, sample, just by looking at splicing, which subtype it is. So, so that's quite, quite good. So, but it's, it's fully descriptive. I mean, um, there's limited things you can learn about this. So we, we're interested in uh, quantifying um, how much maybe novel splicing is there, and also is there more splicing in some cancer types than in others? For this, we did one analysis where we um, normalized for the different uh, number of samples we have uh, for each cancer type. Obviously, when you have more cancers in one cancer type, you find more splicing. So what we did here is we just uh, randomly chose 40 cancers for uh, 40 samples for each of the cancer types. So now it's comparable, and um, and now you see that, uh, for instance, there are some cancer types. Um, this is the number of events um, for each of these cancer types. So for some cancer types, you find a very large number of splicing events. So this is exon skips. So you find 40,000 exon skips um, for this uh, um, cancer type. And this dark bar here, that's uh, the number of uh, exon skips which have been confirmed by, or have been annotated before in the annotation. So it's actually a pretty small part, which is annotated, and 80% uh, is, is new. So 
but there's very good evidence for it. We see it in multiple samples, we see it with many reads, and uh, there's uh, high confirmation rates uh, for, for these uh, splicing events. So, so there's a lot of new splicing going on. Um, it is highly variable across uh, cancer types, and um, yeah, and we thought, okay, that's interesting. What can we do with it, right? So, and um, what we also see is that um, there's more alternative splicing going on when you compare normal samples versus cancer samples. So, um, for instance, here, here you have the, um, the number of alternative splicing events in average um, for the tumor samples versus the normal samples. And for some of the cancer types, there's a big uh, difference in, altern in alternative splicing between tumor and normals. So, for instance, for uh, Lourdes, a lung adenocarcinoma or lung squamous, there's quite big differences in the amount of alternative splicing which we see. And in some, maybe, uh, thyroid cancer, there's not such, such a big difference. So the hypothesis is that uh, the splicing mechanism is somewhat disrupted, uh, and, and this leads to additional splicing events uh, which are spliced in a certain way, right? So, and, and that's, I think, what, yeah, that's, that's one interpretation of this data. So we're interested in finding um, genetic reasons why certain splicing happens. So, and you can do this by, by looking at um, an association study where you look at a correlation of a somatic mutation with a splicing event somewhere else in the genome. And uh, for this, you usually use generalized linear models. I don't want to explain it in detail here. So um, this is the somatic uh, change here, um, and we try to explain the splicing change. And there are some additional factors which are confounding factors which we try to factor out uh, wherever possible. So, and we did this in cis and in trans. Um, and in trans, this is actually quite a big of, uh, bit of compute which we have to do. We have to correlate essentially every position in the genome with every splicing event uh, which, which we find. So maybe somatic mutations, we have thousands of them, maybe 10,000. And uh, splicing events, we have 100,000 uh, events. And we have to see whether there's a correlation between these two. And after proper filtering and a lot of manual work to, to get this clean, um, we find um, first, uh, not surprising, um, that there is a diagonal, right? So because um, um, you have a splicing event which is next to an exon, and that, uh, that exon uh, may be affected in, in its splicing. So this is this diagonal. But you also see kind of uh, stripes here, right? So, and this means that there is a somatic mutation in a certain place, for instance, here in chromosome 2, and this affects splicing in many different places across the genome. So, and some of these cases are known. Um, for instance, uh, I think uh, this stripe here, this is SF3V1, uh, is a splicing factor. You have a mutation in the splicing factor, and this leads to splicing changes all over the genome. But there's many cases, actually, where it's not known, right? So uh, here's the count of how many events are actually uh, that a somatic mutation affects. So for SF3V1, maybe you have 500 targets uh, where we see a splicing change uh, when you have a somatic mutation of a certain type. Uh, but there's other cases uh, where, which, which we are not known, which are not even RNA binding. It may be a secondary effect. So there's a lot of uh, food for thought uh, how to interpret this. But uh, I think we have done um, the study here quite uh, thoroughly. And I believe these stripes are probably really there. So, um, so maybe uh, not, not totally surprising is the uh, cis splicing effect. Um, uh, when you have um, a somatic mutation or a germline variant which is close to an exon boundary, then this can have an effect on the splicing of that specific exon. So, and here's a distribution of, of um, somatic or germline variants uh, which we found associated. Um, but it shows that uh, somatic, well, that variants even maybe 100 nucleotides away can have a significant effect on splicing. It's not only the first two nucleotides or something of the intron, the AG or GT, which Effect splicing is that maybe a much wider region of, of the uh, intron which is uh, influencing splicing. Okay, so um, there is, um, we looked another way at, at the data and asked is there something maybe specific to cancer? So we had, uh, we had this idea that maybe splicing is disrupted in some cancers, uh, in some samples. And what we try to define, or what we defined, is a, a cancer-specific splicing mm. burden. So how much additional splicing do you have in a specific sample um, 
which, which goes beyond normal splicing. So essentially look at all the splicing which you see in normal samples and we subtract it from this specific splicing which we see in a sample. So we remove essentially the annotated um, transcripts, we remove um, junctions which you see in GTEx, uh, and then we only keep um, uh, junctions which are commonly observed in Pancan Atlas. And then we count essentially how often do we see a certain junction for one sample. So, and one dot here is one sample, right? And uh, here is uh, the splicing burden was the number of additional introns uh, which we find uh, confirmed in that specific sample. And um, we say uh, if that number is very large, then there's many additional splice events are going on and hence uh, the splicing is probably somewhat disrupted. And uh, what you can see here is um, in purple you have the tumor samples and in green you have normal samples. What you generally see uh, the normal samples are much less disrupted uh, than tumor samples. Okay, so there is really something going on in tumors. And uh, we did this analysis across um, uh, cancer types. Some cancer types seem to be uh, very much affected and some cancer types uh, not so much. So, um, but what I, th what I think is most exciting about it is that um, there, are, there are now specific splice junctions which are tumor specific. They are specific to that um, tumor which you look at. And uh, it turns out that uh, some of these splicing junctions actually recur in, in different samples. So uh, here is an analysis where we look at the recurrence of alternative splicing in different cancer types. Each column here is one cancer type. These are tumors, uh, these are normals, and this is GTEx. Um, and what you see as a color here is the recurrence. That means how many samples have that specific splice change. So there are some splice changes which are shared by 60% of all the cancer types, uh, all the cancer samples, but essentially none of uh, the uh, normal samples or also not uh, anywhere in, in uh, GTEx. So that means this is extremely specific to cancer and it is highly recurrent. That's great because that is something which we can actually target with immunotherapy if we have a, uh, a peptide or I mean a, a vaccine against this specific peptide which could target that. And um, if it is highly recurrent, then actually this uh, peptide would be effect, uh, effective for many patients. Okay, so um, now the question is, are these peptides really there? Um, and uh, so we have these splice junctions, which are new, right? Um, which connect one axon to another. And, and this is a new combination, which is not seen normally. This generates a peptide. Um, that's different from peptides which are generated by somatic mutations. So a somatic mutation would maybe be within an axon, it would change maybe one nucleotide and this changes uh, the peptide. But a splicing change introduces a new intron, a new connection between two axons and that generates um, new uh, peptides which have not been seen before at all. Um, so we generate a list of all these peptides, uh, we do a MHG binding prediction and only uh, let, let uh, the strongest binders pass. Then uh, we look into mass spec data, uh, which has also been obtained uh, for some subset of the TCGA data, which is uh, part of the CP Tech project, and validate, uh, um, I mean, essentially check whether we can find um, the peptides which we predict um, by, by splicing. We also, um, in order to compare it against something, we uh, also did the same for the germline or, or somatic mutations. We also checked whether we find those. So we can actually compare um, the number of peptides which are generated by splicing versus the number of peptides which are generated by uh, SNDs. So and that's, I think, what, what's most interesting is um, uh, here we look for ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and uh, colorectal cancer. Um, here is each dot is one sample. And this is the number of peptides which you can confirm by mass spec, which, has, uh, which is predicted to be MHC binding for uh, splicing peptides. And uh, we can compare this with SNV generated peptides. So in many cases we find uh, exactly zero SNV generated peptides which are uh, confirmed by mass spec and MHC binding. So there's actually much more of those uh, here and hence there's a much greater potential to, uh, to find something which you can use for immunotherapy, for targeted immunotherapy. Okay, so I think this is pretty um, exciting. Um, so the next steps is to show that uh, splicing peptides are actually bound by T cells. Um, 
we have to show that a splicing peptides can be used to target immunotherapy, is that maybe the gene expression of those is high enough so it actually, um, it actually is detected. Um, then we have to show that patients with high splicing burden maybe um, respond better to checkpoint inhibitor therapies. Um, so there's new work funded by SPHN and PHIT together with Mark Rubin and George Kukos uh, to do some of this uh, work. Uh, together with George Kukos in particular to show um, whether the, these peptides are bound by C T cells. Good, so I'm running a little low on time, but uh, so maybe um, I do a little a sh a short version of this. Um, good, so I take questions later. Um, probably I'm too fast anyway. <clears throat> so project three, um, this is a project which is more of a consortium work um, where, um, I mean the whole consortium is probably 800 people. So there's 800 people who try to publish at the same time, uh, which is about now. Um, and, uh, and some of that work will come out very soon on BioArchive and hopefully late, uh, later in Cell. Um, let's see. So. I'm, I'm co-leading uh, the transcript home working group, and this is one aspect of that work which I'm presenting here. And we try to integrate diverse transcriptomic alterations to identify cancer-relevant genes and signatures. Um, and the, the idea of that is uh, that there's many different ways to, to induce an oncogen oncogenic event or to, to disrupt maybe a, um, a gene, a gene's function. So for instance, for MET, uh, there could be a non-synonymous uh, mutation in MET which leads to an activation. It could also be an alternate promoter which leads to a higher expression of MET. It could be a gene fusion which leads to the higher expression of the relevant part of MET, or it could be alternative splicing which changes some piece of the coding sequence which then leads to an activation of MET. So usually uh, people have looked only at uh, the somatic mutations, to a certain extent at fusions, uh, but much less at alternative promoters, alternative splicing and so on. And part of that study is to analyze these different alterations types together and come up with a little algorithm which can find maybe um, genes which are recurrently altered across multiple alteration types. And that's, I think, uh, that's, that's the goal of that uh, work here. So as I said, at ICGC is, um, is an international project. There's many countries involved, uh, if you don't want to read them. Um, and we get data from um, different heterogeneous sources. Um, uh, we get whole genome data on one hand and RNA-seq data on the other hand. So the whole project has about 2,500 2, uh, whole genomes. Um, for this study, we could only use about half of them uh, because only some of them had, had RNA-seq data. So, but we needed RNA-seq data. So we came up with a pipeline which is uh, quite, um, uh, which was the result of much discussions. Uh, we, we ended up in using Top Hat 2 and uh, STAR. Uh, we joined these results uh, and flagged genes where the results were not agreeing between these cases and, and so on. So um, it will be part of another paper describing that. So then we looked at uh, different alteration types. We looked at RNA editing, uh, gene fusions, expression outliers, alternative promoters, alternative splicing, allele species expression on the RNA side and also uh, DNA copy numbers and non-synonymous uh, mutations on the other side. So uh, we try to put them all in the same coordinate system so we can actually do some joint analysis because RNA editing is quite different from let's say copy number variation, right? So um, we had to simplify that. We had to summarize um, alterations per gene. So, and what we did is, um, for instance, for RNA editing or for fusion, uh, we said, well, uh, we say, say this gene is modified if there is a fusion in that gene, period, right? So it's one, uh, if there's a fusion, zero, there's no fusion. Similar with RNA editing, if it's a RNA editing event which leads to a somatic, uh, to a non-synonymous change. Um, then copy number, we said, okay, it's one if the copy number changes more than, I mean, it's greater than four. So it's, it's somewhat arbitrary, but um, we did the same with expression outliers. Uh, we say it passes the filter if uh, the z-score is larger than something. Okay, so these are more quantitative filters. Then um, we took essentially for each gene this vector for each sample, put it into this, this vector, and then we put it essentially into a cube. Um, so here we have about a thousand samples. Here we have um, eight um, different alteration types. So six RNA level alterations, two DNA level alterations, 
and about 16,000 expressed uh, genes. So this is like a three-dimensional matrix, and now we can slice this matrix in different ways. We can either project uh, to uh, the top, we can aggregate over the samples uh, to do a recurrence analysis, or we could do um, uh, over the, what is it, the alteration types uh, to maybe look at different pathways, how they're disrupted, and uh, we can also aggregate over the genes to see maybe whether there are samples which, which have maybe specific patterns. Okay, and here's a, a rough summary. Um, when you look at cancer types, uh, then you see big differences between um, uh, alteration frequencies of the DNA pieces. This is for the different this alternate promoters, expression outliers, and so on. And here DNA. And you see significant differences between the different cancer types. You see, for instance, in kidney, there's much more alternate promoters. And um, um, maybe in lymph uh, BNHL, there is much more alternative splicing going on. So there is specific characteristics for specific cancer types. So that's, that's good. Um, you can also look at um, samples which have, I mean, there's a certain way to look at uh, somatic alterations in, in cancers. So uh, for instance, uh, we can look at um, the mutations in P10, mTOR, uh, PI3 3 kinase, and so on. Uh, for instance, for kidney, and you see that certain samples, one uh, column here is one sample, are mutated. So we find certain mutations um, for a subset of the samples. So in 37 of these samples, we find somatic mutations or copy number um, mutations. If we now include additional um, types of mutations, so uh, we include um, fusions uh, and allele specific expression, splicing outliers, and so on, you can actually find uh, quite a few more samples which have some alterations in these key pathways uh, related to uh, kidney cancer. So, so I guess we have an explanation for, for a larger fraction of samples of what's happening uh, with those, except uh, that the alteration now is not a somatic mutation, but it is uh, something going on the, on the RNA side. So um, a new type of analysis uh, we performed um, to um, identify known and newly recurrently altered genes. So essentially we were interested in genes which across the different alteration types, so we didn't care which alteration, right? So um, across the different alteration types is frequently altered in many cancers or many samples. So a similar type of analysis is done with somatic mutations asking is that somatic mutation uh, frequently or recurrently altered in specific uh, um, cancer types. So we wanted to repeat that, but uh, now across different alteration types. And um, so that's uh, the uh, result of that analy analysis. Uh, so uh, here you have the ranking um, uh, which you came up with, and uh, what you see is, yes, it is highly enriched with um, uh, cancer census genes and with uh, driver genes which are known, but it also shows uh, that there is much, there's a few other genes which are very interesting um, which have not been picked up as cancer census genes before. And um, I can't go much into detail here. So for instance, KLF13, there's some evidence uh, that this is indeed involved in cancer, but it hasn't been picked up by other analyses before. Um, more details about this manuscript, uh, or about this work, will be described in a manuscript which will come out uh, probably next week or, or in a few weeks. So. Okay, so in summary, the group works at the interface of data science and biomedical applications. I skipped a lot of uh, technical work, or for instance, on the scalable graph algorithms for, for large-scale genomics and uh, new training algorithms for recurrent neural networks. Um, uh, I can talk about this another time. Um, I talked about three projects. One is the unbiased analysis of EHR in the context of two more somatic variants. It needs more data, it needs more clinical data, it needs more somatic um, variants from Switzerland, uh, and we push forward uh, to, to get this. Uh, but it also needs more discussions and validations um, with clinicians. So project two, I think I'm pretty excited about uh, because we actually can show that RNA splicing leads to RNA alterations which are potentially targetable by immunotherapy. And that's a, a new work, an ongoing work, which, um, uh, which I think is, is great. Um, and project three is a new way to integrate RNA and DNA alterations to identify key genes um, in tumor, tumorigenesis. So I think overall, uh, the collaboration with uh, life sciences um, 
with, with the life sciences we need um, in order to translate the technology into new science and better healthcare and uh, the uh, initiatives like the SPHN Data Coordination Center or um, PHRT uh, will make these kind of collaborations much easier. So with that, I would like to thank my team. Uh, about half of that team has moved from New York uh, to, uh, to Zurich. Uh, I'm grateful for that and also for their work. And um, I would like to acknowledge a lot of collaborators uh, in New York, also in Zurich and in other places. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.